Once your soul has been enlarged by the truth, it can never return to its original size. Blaise Pascal In this video, we'll be taking a broad look at how the 1800s seems to be one of the most puzzling centuries in history, particularly in America. We'll examine these six areas of activity in the context of historical resets and how there seems to be much more to the story than we've been told. Further, while everything was going on, disaster seemed to strike at every turn in the form of fire and flood. How was all this done in 100 years? Welcome back to Geomancy. As always, thank you for joining me. This video is going to have even the most esteemed historians scratching their heads if they watch till the end. We're going to start off with war, okay? There's so much going on in the 1800s, but you need to understand that the wars, how, how, did, how did everything get done with so much war? This is one of the bloodiest centuries in history. Now, it seems like everywhere across this realm was battling and warring. If you look at the Wikipedia page for the list of wars from 1800 to 1899, it's going to take you a while before you even get to 1820. But we're not going to look at all these wars deeply. And in America, we're really just going to look at the Civil War. Take a quick look at this. Now, we are told that the Civil War was fought between the Union States and the Confederate States over the issue of slavery. And essentially, the picture that we are given and that I've been given since a kid, more or less, it was good white people against not so good white people over black slaves. Now, what's interesting with the Civil War is when you look at photos, you'll notice that they're all very carefully staged and you actually don't find any battle photos. And the photos that you find of skeletons or bodies, they're completely down to the bone, which doesn't make sense because it takes years for bodies to decompose. But just take a quick look at some of these photos and you'll see, yeah, it's, they look very staged. I believe that the Civil War was not entirely what we were taught about and that the warring parties actually have different identities than we were told. And I think the Civil War cemented a change in American history. Now, here you have the two leaders of the Union and the Confederate. You've got Abe Lincoln, a Republican on the left, and you've got Jefferson Davis, a Democrat on the right. Do note that they look rather similar. Interesting, but that's the topic for another debate. Here you see a picture of Abe Lincoln with two men on either side. And I think these guys had cold hands because their hands are in their coat. Or maybe they're signaling something to us as these are also other generals of the Civil War hiding one of their hands. Now, if you're not familiar with what this symbol is, it is essentially a Pledge of Allegiance. And it's indicating who these people work for. We see this same thing throughout history, throughout time and space. And regardless of whether you think somebody is good historically or not so good historically, they're all part of it. Even the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, down there on the bottom right. So the hidden hand is something that signifies to those who know what's really going on. Interesting stuff. It's a part of a club and we ain't in it. The next topic that is mind blowing of the 1800s is education. Seems like our whole educational system sprung up from the colleges and schools and universities 
ways of thought. But even the dictionary, the Webster's 1828 dictionary was the first edition published on April 14th, 1828. Now, what I find interesting about this dictionary is the definition of what an American is. And it says American with a apostrophe, a native of America originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans. Now, what would one of these copper colored races look like? This might give you some indication. That's my arm, actually, with a copper colored penny. Back to the education. Again, every college and university, except for like five, came out of the 1800s, miraculously. I've gone into some of the buildings that we see on these campuses, such as the main building at University of Notre Dame. Now, for those who don't know, the building before this burned down in the fire in 1878. And three weeks after that fire, they started construction on this building. And three months later, it was done. Yes, does not make sense. So here's something you need to keep in mind as we look at history and these specific things. All you need to do in any case is find one proof that the official narrative is a complete lie. And then that's going to open up the floodgates for new possibilities and realities that we perhaps never considered. But when you look at some of the top colleges and universities in the United States, coast to coast, they all got their start in the mid to late 1800s. And if they were started earlier, such as Princeton, the name was changed in the late 1800s. Princeton used to just be called the College of New Jersey. 1896, I believe, is when it became Princeton. Yeah. And I've, I've been on that campus and have showed you what it looks like. But when you look around, it makes you wonder, how did they get all this done amidst the war, amidst everything that was going on? Now, I put one on this that is different than the others, and that is Smith College. Smith College is an all-women's college founded in the late 1800s. And you wouldn't think that an all-women's school at this time and, and age would need the same outrageous campus that anywhere else would, right? Especially if it's just for 20, 30, 100 women. Hmm. Well, let's take a look. So as you can see, already, before we even get to the front gate, you're like, huh, this is nice. But we also begin to see architectural forms and features that we've closely examined throughout this channel. Down to the color of the bricks, the ornamentation. I truly couldn't believe what I was seeing on this campus. We've got stepped gables, which I've talked about. And I'll be honest, this campus felt very Dutch. And the more that I understand the history and the architecture and the identities of people, it became clear why. Again, late 1800s. Why would this campus and this school need all of these types of buildings? Buildings that you could find in Europe. And certainly buildings that we see all over the United States. It's a bit perplexing. I'm not saying that women shouldn't have something like this at that time, but just like I debunk all the other universities and expose how the histories are full of holes, something's not adding up. So what we talk about 
with these kinds of campuses and institutions is that they were merely claimed after the reset. And it would be one thing if the college itself had these buildings, but the entire town that Smith is in, which is Northampton, Massachusetts, is full of these buildings. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Typical reset town. Honestly, I'm at the point, as you can probably tell if you've watched at least another of my videos, where I can go anywhere and find the same things. It's actually a bit wild, but it just keeps happening. And these are small towns. We're not talking major cities. I might have to do a small town USA. And this is the town hall of Northampton. Amazing. So how are these towns filled up with people? Well, that is a topic for future videos and many in the hidden history community do work on this. So you're probably familiar with the orphans and the incubator babies and the trains. But what we are told is that in the late 1800s, people in many parts of the world decided to leave their homes and immigrate to the United States. Hey, hun, you want to move to the United States? I hear there's opportunity. Yeah, sure. As if that's what actually happened. No, it was a massive shuffling up of the fabric of reality. People were being moved, transported, killed, and their memories erased. What you'll notice when you start to look into towns and cities in the United States is while they may have been settled or founded in earlier times, they were almost always incorporated in the 1800s. And the reason for this is simple. Post-1776, America became the United States of America, a corporate entity. So every single town, city, and municipality needed to be incorporated. And even on the West Coast, as we've talked about with this miraculous panorama of San Francisco in 1878, just 30 years after settling, they can have a whole city like this built and the population go from under a thousand to almost a quarter of a million. This is the official narrative. How on earth did this happen? Again, the esteemed historians can't give us a clear answer. With technology, that city that you just looked at was built without any motorized mechanical equipment, but the 1800s was a boom of technology and invention, right? And we've covered many of these before. In particularly, one of the biggest inventions, the railroad, and somehow it was booming. Hundreds of thousands of miles of track laid. And the train, as I talked about, was only created in the early 1800s by this gentleman. And in the United States, this company became one of the largest producers of steam locomotives in the world. In fact, it was the largest producer all in the 1800s. While all the men are fighting at war, getting killed, blown up, we seem to have massive development, right? But it's not even the crazy big inventions like trains and, and electricity and all this kind of stuff. It's simple things like the mason jar. 1800s. And I'm sure you could do just like I've done and take a look around your house and begin to find some things flower company I use, oldest company in the state of Utah. Grandma's molasses, even Rumford baking soda and baking powder. In the bathroom, you might find some stuff. 
truly amazing. But consider, how come we don't see companies prior to 1800? Construction, how was all of this stuff done? Massive feats of engineering and construction, coast to coast. And again, I'm focusing on America, but same story anywhere. Europe obviously has an older history, according to the narrative. But in America, we're told that all of this just sprung up. That it was just passionate, pioneering men and women rolling up their sleeves and getting it done. I've examined the smallest unit of construction, the brick, and how the industry seemed to go from simple, rudimentary techniques like we see here to mechanized techniques like this brick machine created by 21-year-old Cyrus Chambers. And these things revolutionized everything. But when we look at construction photos of the 1800s, we rarely ever see complete photos of construction. We usually see the end parts of it. The building being topped with a roof, decorations, ornamentations, etc. But hardly ever will you see a cornerstone laid. Despite that, amazing feats of architecture everywhere. Now, this Baltimore City Hall you see in the top left was said to have been designed by a 20-year-old before the Civil War, okay? A 20-year-old before the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, when everyone was killed, they went ahead and, and built it up. But it's the same strange stories. And I've covered at length the history behind some of these buildings and their creators. So feel free to check out the prolific architects of the late 1800s if you want to learn more. But it's not just buildings, it's infrastructure, it's civil engineering, like the Fairmount Waterworks, which I've also shown. Many of these things pertaining to water were all done in the 1800s. And here we have the Pennsylvania Canal, which had many subsystems. Now, they tell us construction began in 1826, completed about 1840. And then by 1900, they said, no, nah, we're good. We're not going to be using this. Trains are good. Thanks, though, for all that work and however much resources it took to get it done. Thanks. But here you can see a subset of what one of these canals look like. Here's the Schuylkill Canal. And I've also talked about the word Schuylkill. It's a Dutch word meaning hidden river. And that's one of the locks. What's that? You want to see what it looks like? All right, come on. So here we are at lock 60, and we can see just what some of this infrastructure looks like up close. It truly is amazing, regardless of when it was done, when it was actually built. And here we've got some good history on what we're looking at. But whether it was built when they say it was or much earlier, it's amazing. Absolutely. And this would have been dug out without the use of excavators. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. Now, right here, there was said to have been a power generating building. On the left side here, you'll see the Schuylkill River, and here's the canal, looking back at the lock. It's unbelievable. And this is one of many. Now, this is still not in use, but it still exists. Many of the canals were filled in 
beginning in the 1900s, unfortunately. So we're going to end with some fun and games, because what would this century be without leisure or leisure, depending on where you are? The world's fairs, travel, sports, everything began in this century. Again, with all the wars, all the destruction, everything else not so good that was taking place, we had time for fun and games, okay? Hmm. Sports. I used to be a pretty good athlete back in my day. But now I understand sports from a whole deeper level. Maybe if I understood it at the level I do now, then I may have been better. But it seems like every single sport and athletic form of entertainment was created in the 1800s. Baseball, basketball, football, soccer, the Olympics, hockey, swimming, volleyball, you name it, came out of the 1800s. And when you start to dig into the histories of their creators, you will find secret societies such as Skull and Bones, Freemasons, etc. The creator of basketball and volleyball, for example, knew each other. So it really is amazing that all of this was possible. Now, when you look at sporting stadiums, what do we see? We see something that looks like an amplifier and a receiver. Perhaps something that plays a vital role on the Earth's electrical circuit. More on that in the future. But also, what about these world's fairs? Right? Many people have studied this and go deep. But when you actually look at the populations and the attendance, it's mind-blowing. Truly. For example, the 1900 Paris World Exposition was said to have had 48 million visitors. That's over a quarter of a million a day. Okay. And the other attendances, not too shabby either. Consider that these World's Fairs were only held for six months. Compare that with these stats that we see from a five years ago about the most traveled cities, countries, and theme parks in the world. And the numbers are far smaller. So before planes, somehow people were able to travel worldwide, stay at these places. And as you can see in that photo, that's a lot of people. It baffles the mind. And just like the other topics in this video, deserves its own separate investigation, which I plan on. But what do you see with these world fairs? Well, you see amazing architecture. You see the rollout of new technologies and inventions. And you see the otherwise acculturation of a new society. Now, what gets me is that we are told that most of these buildings and structures at the World's Fairs were said to be temporary structures built only for that six month World's Fair and then destroyed after. And certainly, if you look at some photos, you will definitely see structures that don't look permanent. However, some just are too magnificent to think that they could build them in such a short time for such a short time and then get rid of them after. This is the horticultural building from the Philadelphia 1876 Centennial Exposition. And here's an overhead shot. 
So these buildings just built for the for the expo and then gotten rid of after. However, they tell us that there's usually one building that remains in many cities. One building from the expo or from the fair that they kept. And when you actually look at it, it's not a building that appears to be temporarily constructed. This is what I mean. So we're standing here in front of the Memorial Hall from Philadelphia, which is now a children's museum. But once President Ulysses S. Grant stood on those steps in front of me and gave the opening speech for the 1876 fair. And we see, for lack of a better word, a typical old world building. There's nothing temporary about this structure. And it follows many of the same design principles of buildings all over the world. Now, just across the way would have been those other buildings that we could see in the aerial shot. But truly magnificent. Makes you wonder. Really makes you wonder. How is it all possible? Well, that's all I got for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, I really appreciate it. Take care. Be well.